interested in just the week 9 waiver wire segment of this video, feel free to skip ahead using the timestamps located down below in the description. And if you're interested in a recap of all of week 8's NFL action, then look no further, we're going to start right here. But before we do, just a disclaimer, uh, my girlfriend is in the room and she is sick, so you might hear some coughing. My roommate is also sick. We all went to a rave over the weekend and, uh, well, my roommate got COVID and it's likely that me, my girlfriend, and everyone that went to the rave has COVID, but I'm feeling pretty okay right now. I've never had COVID before, so, uh, fingers crossed, you know, there's a first for everything. And yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But as of right now, feeling good, ready to record. And yeah, this video might be a little bit quicker than usual just due to that fact. You might hear a little bit more background noise than usual. But yeah, with that, let us dive right into our Thursday night football game. This was a matchup between the Minnesota Vikings and the Los Angeles Rams. And in this game, we had, uh, in a big surprise, the Los Angeles Rams coming out victorious with a 30-20 to win over the Vikings. That is the Vikings' second straight loss after starting off 5-0, and and the Rams climbed to a record of 3-4. and In this game, we saw Sam Darnold complete 18 of 25 passes for 240 yards and two touchdowns. Aaron Jones rushed 19 times for 58 yards. Justin Jefferson catch eight passes for 115 yards. And then for the Rams, we had Matthew Stafford complete 25 of 34 passes for 279 yards, four touchdowns, and one interception. Kyron Williams carried the ball 23 times for 97 yards, and Bukunagua, in his return off of IR, had seven catches for 106 yards. Now, the biggest takeaway from this game, on the Viking side of things, it's got to be the offensive line. Uh, I think that the offensive line has seen better days for this Vikings group. In this game, they allowed three sacks, and the rushing game really wasn't able to get established as it was in some of the other matchups. Uh, they were only able to muster 2.9 yards per rush, which is not ideal. So, main point of attraction, or point of worry for the Vikings. And as for the Rams, I have to say I'm impressed, you know, with Cooper Cup coming back, not off IR, just from injury, and then Puka Nakua coming back off of IR. This Rams offense is revitalized. They are ready to get back into winning football. Matthew Stafford looks sharp out there for touchdown passes, and honestly, the Rams are ready to compete in this NFC West. They are not far behind at all. All the other teams had a record of 4-4. Four and four. The Rams won game back at 3-4. and four. They are in it to win it. They can definitely take this division if they want to. So we'll have to see how things pan out. But yeah, <coughs> that's the first of many. Uh, yeah, you, uh, the Rams are, they could do it. They could definitely come in and take this division. Winning a big one on Thursday night. After that, we've got a matchup between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Cincinnati Bengals. In this game, the Eagles will climb to a record of 5 and 2, beating the Cincinnati Bengals 37 to 17, sending the Bengals down to a record of 3 and 5. Here, we see Jalen Hurts complete 16 of 20 passes for 236 yards and a touchdown. Saquon Barkley rushes 22 times for 108 yards, and Devontae Smith catches eight, six passes for 85 yards <laughs> and a score. Joe Burrow, on the other hand, for the Bengals, has 26 of 37 completions for 234 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Chase Brown has 12 carries for 32 yards and a touchdown, and Mike Kosecki leads the wideouts with seven receptions for 73 yards. And key takeaways from this game, we've got on the Eagles, I honestly am impressed. I think this is exactly what the Eagles offense should be looking for. Like. <coughs> uh, I've been hyping them up all year. They are at a record of 5-2, and two, but not every victory has been as impressive as this one. Uh, this is what they ideally should be playing like. No turnovers, efficient passing, over 150 rushing yards, and four touchdowns on the offensive side of the ball along with three field goals. This is, you know, division winning football. So if they can keep playing like this, they have a chance to take the division back from the commanders. As for the Bengals, I've 
can say week in and week out, I think that there's just too much pressure on Joe Burrow with the running game being as bad as it is. Once again, there is a very bad rushing offense for the Bengals. Only 58 yards in the ground game for them. And one of the key areas where we can see uh, it was second and two, the Bengals in this game, they went for a fourth and one and they could not convert. So they lost you know, possession on downs, and they were only down like seven points, but they made an eight-yard play on first down, and second and two, two straight plays, they are unable to gain two yards with the running backs, that is how horrible their running game is, so on fourth down, they decide to go for a short pass to Jamar Chase, and it gets broken up, well, yeah, it just gets dismantled, I think it was by Cooper Dijon, and so, you have to be able to get two yards when necessary. The Eagles have that one yard super play, the tush push. We saw them use at the goal line many times. The Bengals just cannot pick up a yard to save their life and that really is going to kill this team. So they need to figure out their running back situation quickly because Joe Burrow just cannot be your saving grace a week in and week out. After that, we have a stunning game between the Baltimore Ravens and the Cleveland Browns. The Ravens would lose this game 24 to 29. The Cleveland Browns picking up their second win of the year, climbing to a record of 2 and 6, while the Ravens fall to 5 and 3. In this game, Lamar Jackson went 23 of 38 for 289 yards and two touchdowns. Derrick Henry rushed 11 times for 73 yards and a score. And Zay Flowers had seven catches for 115 yards. Jameis Winston, he gets the start for the Cleveland Browns. He goes 27 of 41 for 334 yards, three touchdowns, and then Nick Chubb rushes the ball 16 times for 52 yards. And Cedric Tillman leading this group once again with seven catches for 99 yards and two touchdowns. Ah, uh, shocker. You know, I think this is kind of like that upset victory with the Panthers over the Raiders earlier this year, but on a much greater extent. Uh, you've got a backup quarterback. They couldn't really scout against him. Jameis, obviously a talented arm. As he said in the postgame presser, if I'm making excellent decisions, if I'm making great decisions, I am a great quarterback. And really, that's all it comes down to, his decision making. And he played this game <coughs> phenomenally. So, hats off to the Browns. They get a much needed win. I think their season is still doomed, but they they know that Deshaun Watson was the problem. So, as far as takeaways go for the Ravens, it's got to be the dropped interceptions this year. Kyle Hamilton with a chance to put the game away. I think it's on like second down with a minute left. He has a ball thrown directly into his hands by Jameis Winston. He drops it. The very next play, uh, a beautiful touchdown pass from Jameis Winston to Cedric Tillman to get the Browns to lead it again in this game. So, uh, right now the, Braven, the Ravens quarterback group are just secondary. They lead all defenses in dropped interceptions with eight on the year. They need to work on their dip ball drills and their hands, really. Uh, and as for the Browns, send Deshaun Watson to China. Man, if this shows you anything, it's how bad Deshaun Watson is. You take him out for one game, you put in Jameis Winston for one game, he goes for over 20 points, over 300 passing yards. Deshaun Watson failed experiment. Get him out of there. Next up, we've got a matchup between the Tennessee Titans and the Detroit Lions. I hope we have no Titans fans in attendance because this was a slaughterhouse. Uh, Detroit beating the Titans 52 to 14 in this game. It was a frenzy, and they didn't even really do that much through the air. We had starting off with the Titans, Mason Rudolph. 22 of 38 passes for 266 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Tony Pollard with 20 carries for 94 yards, and Calvin Ridley with an impressive 10 catches for 143 yards. This coming after the DeAndre Hopkins trade. Then Jared Goff, he goes 12 of 15 for only 85 yards, and still he manages to throw three touchdowns. Jameer Gibbs, 11 carries. 127 yards and a touchdown. And then Sam Laborda, 6 catches for 40.
48 yards and a touchdown. Uh, absolutely dismantling this Titans team. They were having fun with it. The Detroit Lions are going absolutely berserk uh, as far as key takeaways because the Titans. There's nothing you can really say after something like this. I'm gonna obviously so much so much going wrong. I'm just gonna focus on something positive. I think that the DeAndre Hopkins trade at least means you have a happy Calvin Ridley. He paid Calvin Ridley a lot of money over the summer. He was upset two weeks ago uh, last week as a as an okay game, and then this week he really flourishes with the up gone. So you made your your newly acquired wide receiver happy, and uh, you can take that as a win. As for the Lions, I've got to say, this is the scariest offense in the entire NFL. Uh, they can get it done any which way. Over the last four games, they are averaging 43 points per game, and I, I believe this is the stat in their last four or five games, uh, maybe their last 25 possessions, they have 25 touchdowns and 19 incompletions. They are playing ultra-efficient football. Jared Goff is wheeling and dealing. They don't even need to throw the ball to win these games. Amon Ross St. Brown had like, <laughs> he had like two catches for 70 yards. Seven yards, something like that. And they won this game by leaps and bounds. The Lions are absolutely electric, and I am excited to see how far they go. After that, we've got a matchup between the Arizona Cardinals and the Miami Dolphins in a very, very close game. The Cardinals come out on top with a final score of 28 to 27, making the Cardinals, uh, giving the Cardinals a 4 and 4 record on the year, while Miami falls to 2 and 5. In this game, Kyler Murray goes 26 of 36 for 370 yards, two touchdowns. James Conner has 20 carries for 53 yards, actually very inefficient, and one touchdown. Trey McBride, the leading guy for this uh, Cardinals team on National Tight Ends Day, he has nine catches for 124 yards. In Tua Tagovailoa's first uh, start in his return from IR, we see him go 28 of 38 for 234 yards and a touchdown. Devon A. Chan elevated back to RB1 status with Tua back in. He has 10 carries for 97 yards. That's the kind of efficiency we saw from him last year. And then Tyreek Hill with a, a solid day. Uh, he has 6 catches for 72 yards. Yeah, as far as takeaways go, uh, I've, I've got to say I am totally wowed by this NFC West. I did think that the Cardinals had the worst odds. Uh, this is a stack division. I didn't think that they were going to do all that great. Maybe finished like slightly above positive. Maybe even they go 9-8. I was thinking more like a 7-9. I'm uh, sorry, an 8-9. Uh, I didn't think that they had any chance of making the playoffs before the season. But with the way that things have panned out to the first eight games, the fact that they're 4-4, four four, they're actually at the top of the division. And the rest of their schedule is not that hard. They have a solid chance of making the playoff. So, just congratulations <laughs> on that. I did not expect to be able to say that halfway through the season, but you guys are there. So just keep doing your thing. And as for the Dolphins, uh, you know, I'm not going to dog on them. This was a great bounce back game. Tua comes back. They get the offense rolling once again. 27 points is a lot of points. It may be a little bit too late to save your season right now, though. Uh, just looking at the way that things are going, you're 2 and 5. The upcoming schedule is not that easy. Uh, and as Joe Burrow has said, to make the playoffs, you probably do need to win 10 games. And you've already played 7 games in this season. Getting eight of your next ten is going to be extremely difficult. I don't know if the playoffs are really within uh, question for this year. So my main priority would be just get keep to upright, make sure he's healthy, and see how good the offense can be still. But yeah, after that, we've got a glorious, glorious matchup between the rival New York Jets and the New England Patriots. And the surprise of me, the surprise of maybe many, uh, the 
team Patriots come out in top in this division rivalry, winning at home 25-22 over the Jets. The Patriots and Jets both now set a 2-6 record in this game. We saw, <coughs> we saw Aaron Rodgers go 17 of 28 for 233 yards and two touchdowns. Brees Hall get 16 carries for 80 yards, and Garrett Wilson have five catches for 113 yards. For the Patriots, Drake May exits the game with a concussion. So, Jacoby Brissett coming back into the game. He throws 15 of 24 passes for 132 yards. Ramon Ray Stevenson carries spot 20 times for only 48 yards and two touchdowns. And Kayshawn Boutet with three catches for 46 yards. But, as my takeaways go, for the Jets, it's over. It is over. I bought into the hype two years in a row. I fully thought you guys could do it. This cements it. You guys are cooked. And I say this with a smile because it was my team to do it. But at the same time, I feel so bad. Because you guys have been suffering and suffering and suffering for all these years. I truly thought Aaron Rodgers would elevate this offense. You guys had a phenomenal defense last year. I do not know. Honestly, the franchise is cursed. You guys need to completely rebrand, and you need a new kicker, because you definitely could have won this game if Greg Zerline didn't miss another 40-yarder. So, go get that new kicker. <laughs> and as for the Patriots, Jacoby Brissett, I owe you an apology. I was familiar with your game. I still am. You still threw for 130 yards, but the two-minute drill was immaculate. You went in there. About two and a half minutes left. Charged down the field, beautiful ball to Boutte, uh, you know, set us up, fourth down, fourth down in the game on the line, get Ramondre Stevenson the ball, he goes in, we score the touchdown, it feels good, even though the Patriots are one of the worst teams in the season, in the, in the league, it is nice to pick up another victory, and it is nice to be at the same record as the Jets when I thought that the Jets were going to win the division, so... Yes, bad on me, but also, I don't mind. Next up, we've got a matchup between the Atlanta Falcons and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. In this game, the Falcons would top up the Buccaneers once again, winning 30-26 to against their division rival. Here we had Kirk Cousins going, <coughs> going ham once again against Tampa Bay, going 23 of 29 for 276 yards and 4 touchdowns. Bijan Robinson had 13 carries for 63 yards and Kyle Pitts with 4 catches for 91 yards and 2 touchdowns on National Tight Ends Day. On the Buccaneers side of things, we had Baker Mayfield go 37 of 50 passing for 330 yards, 3 touchdowns and 2 interceptions. Bucky Irving leading this backfield with 9 carries for 44 yards, and Cade Otten with 9 catches for 81 yards and 2 touchdowns. As far as takeaways go, uh, for the Falcons, I am going to lead with another, another criticism, just because you guys nearly choked this one again. Uh, in the fourth, it was a string of bad, bad possessions, almost a lot of Buccaneers to climb back into the game. You are leading in the third quarter, 31 to 17, and then how did it go? You had the Buccaneers throw an interception. You guys suffer a safety, and then you miss a field goal. All in the fourth quarter. Uh, it is not good, not ideal. It's fourth quarter has been, I think, what, two weeks ago, when you guys split the Seahawks, that was really when you fell apart, and this is another game where in the fourth quarter, even in the second half as a whole, you guys scored one touchdown, most of the score came from the first half, built it early late in the first half, but punt, punt, one touchdown, but then a safety and a missed field goal, second half needs a lot of cleaning up, especially the fourth quarter, crunch time, you guys have to be better, you have to be more like you were against the Buccaneers in the last game, uh, I guess in overtime at least, and yeah, but when 
it's all said and done, you you got the win. You lead the division comfortably, and yeah, good job. As for the Buccaneers, not much to say. You nearly had it in this game. Obviously down a bunch, but all you really missed was those three turnovers. The three turnovers were crucial. Lost this game by five points. Even at the end of the game, it wasn't all that far. You were only what, 15 yards? No. You're about 40 yards from scoring, but nonetheless, that's like not that bad. Uh, so 40 yards away from winning the game, and you have made three turnovers. So if you limit the turnovers, you had a chance. Just try and work on that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys props because you dealt with so many injuries last week. So to bounce back like this, this was a pretty good performance. Your offense is still pretty viable. Uh, just see if you can do slightly better in the turnover category. Now, after that, we've got a matchup between the Green Bay Packers and the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Packers would walk away victorious in this game, winning 30-27 over the Jaguars. Very close. Uh, in this game, Jordan Love completed 14 of 22 passes for 196 yards and an interception. He did not finish the game, left the game with a groin injury, and so Malik Willis was the one to close it out against the Jags. We also have Josh Jacobs going 25 carries for 127 yards and two touchdowns. And then Tucker Craft with three catches for 78 yards and a score on National Tight Ends Day. Uh, after that, Trevor Lawrence leading the Jags with 21 of 32 passing for 308 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. We've also got Dick Bigsby leading the backfield with 18 carries for 78 yards and Brian Thomas Jr. who had three catches for 60 yards and a score. As far as takeaways go in this game for the Packers, I've got to say, oh, I did not think very much of the Malik Willis acquisition when it happened earlier this year. Packers traded for him from the Titans. I thought, what an inconsequential and random pickup for them, but the man has been magnificent for the Packers this season. Very efficient in the passing game. Can pick up yardage with his feet. He looks so much better in the system than he ever did in Tennessee. And that move was amazing. So, you know, I have to give credit where credit is due. The Green Bay front office, they, they know what's up. They knew what they were doing when they got Malik Willis. Fantastic move by them, and it, it really has saved their season, because if they did not have an adequate backup, they would have lost so many more games at this point, but Malik Willis, every time he has been called upon, he has delivered, so congratulations to Malik Willis. And for the Jaguars, it, it was close. It was a three-point game. You, you really did a lot right. Uh, the only things you do need to work on are the penalties and the third downs. In this game, you have eight penalties for 59 yards lost. That's a field goal right there. <coughs> and third down, the play calling on third down maybe needs a little bit of a switch up because as effective as you were offensively, 390 yards of offense, you were one of nine on third down. So look at the play sheet. Think about what you're doing that is so obvious on third down and don't do that because obviously the backers are able to stop you on that third down. Maybe the first two you had more success, but once you get deeper into that playbook, it is not getting. So switch it up a little bit. Try and incorporate different looks. I didn't rush this game, so I don't know what you guys are doing on third down, but it is not working. I would try and switch it up. Uh, yeah, that's my that's my best advice, because honestly, this was one of your best games of the season. You almost took down a very hard opponent, so you did well. Next up, we have a matchup between the Indianapolis Colts and the Houston Texans. The Texans would take down the Colts in this game with a final score of 23-20. to 20. Uh, Here we had Anthony Richardson going 10 of 32 for 175 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Horrible performance. Uh, we've got Jonathan Taylor with 20 carries for 105 yards and a touchdown, and then Josh Downs with 4 catches for 109 yards and a touchdown. For the 
exits. C.J. Stroud goes 25 of 37 for 285 yards and a score. Joe Mixon with 25 carries for 102 yards and a touchdown. And then Stephon Diggs with 5 catches for 81 yards. Here, the key takeaway for the Colts. Uh, it, it is a brutal one. Uh, it's Anthony Richardson fumbling his career away. He, in this game, the Colts are faced with a third down. I think the Colts have just suffered a sack. And Anthony Richardson exits the game. They kick a field goal. And after the game, in the post-game presser, they ask, Why did you exit the game on that play? Like, what was the rationale? What was the reasoning behind it? And Bro says, You know, honestly, I was just tired. I had a lot of running on the play before. And I was tired. And I've seen some people justify this. Like, what? A man can't be tired? No. Anthony Richardson does not have the leash to be tired. This is perhaps the dumbest post-game presser response I have ever seen in my life. I, I, I kid you not. This is one of the worst responses I have ever seen. He literally was benched after saying this to the media because who in their right mind goes out there tells the entire world I could not stay in the game because I was out of breath. I could not score a touchdown because I, I got a little wheezy. That is not acceptable, bro. Like, lie. Micah Parsons said in, in like a podcast or some video, the dude needs to be a better liar. That is absolutely true. You cannot go out there, throw 10 of 32, lose the game, and then say, I was tired. Like, your career might actually be over because of this, because the Colts have just said that Joe Flacco will now be the starting quarterback. So, astounding. <laughs> and uh, as for the Texans, I think overall pretty good game, but red zone play calling does need a bit of work. The Texans did go 2 of 6 on red zone attempts in this game. Uh, obviously much better than the Colts, who are 1 of 2, but if you're making the red zone 6 times, ideally you're not just scoring 23 points. That is a lot of points left to your kicker. Uh, you ideally want to turn more of those into touchdowns. But yeah. After that, we've got a matchup between the New Orleans Saints and the Los Angeles Chargers. Here, the Chargers would beat the Saints with a final score of 26 to 8. Uh, the Saints fall to 2 and 6 on the air. The Chargers climb to 4 and 3. We've got Spencer Rattler going 12 of 24 for 156 yards. Alvin Kamara rushing 10 times for 67 yards. And Chris Olave with 8 catches for 107 yards. Justin Herbert goes 20 of 32 for 279 yards and two touchdowns. J.K. Dobbins with 70 carries for 57 yards and a score. And Lad McConkey with six catches for 111 yards and two touchdowns. As far as the key takeaways go from this game, I would say for the Saints, you've tried Hayner, you've tried Rattler. I know that Derek Carr is projected to come back in week nine, but if he does not, give Taysom Hill a shot. I think it's bound, it's worth exploring. Rattler obviously, <coughs> not, Rattler obviously is not working. Hater, I'm not all that impressed by him. I think Taysom Hill has been on this team long enough, contributed to winning football long enough, and done enough for the organization that you can actually try and have him play a game at quarterback, or at least give him more reps. Like, there's no reason he's only throwing once in this game. His actual position was quarterback once upon a time. I know you use him like a Swiss Army tool, but maybe give him like 10 passes, see what happens. And yeah. As for the Chargers, uh, I think that this was Lad McConkey's breakout game. Obviously, it was Lad McConkey's breakout game before the season. This was speculated to happen. They had a very thin wide receiver group. 
Quentin Johnston, uh, Joshua Palmer, they had a DJ Chark, but Ladd McConkey was the most likely guy playing out of the slot to take over as the number one target for Justin Herbert. We hadn't seen it happen. Had some games here and there that were good. This cements it. He should be the wide receiver one for this offense going forward. Now you've got a trustworthy connection between Justin Herbert and like an actual skilled wide receiver. Wide receiver. You're still a run first offense. Your offensive identity is complete. I think this offense is a lot more trustworthy going forward. Now we know what to expect out of them. Next up after that, we have a matchup between the Buffalo Bills and the Seattle Seahawks. The Bills spanked the Seahawks in this game, defeating them 31-10 to uh, in their own home field. The Bills go to a record of 6-2 and two on the year, and the Seahawks fall to 4-4. Four and four. Here we had Josh Allen going 24 of 34 for 283 yards, two touchdowns, and his first interception of the year. James Cook goes 17 carries for 111 yards and two touchdowns. Very productive day. And in the receiving game, we have Cleo Shakir with nine catches for 170 yards. For the Seahawks, no DK back half today. So Geno Smith goes 21 of 29 for 212 yards and an interception. He is also the leading rusher in this game with five carries for 16 yards. And Jackson Smith in Jigba uh, steps up with six catches for 69 yards in DK's absence. Alright, as far as takeaways go for the Bills, the division is yours. Uh, with the Jets being so bad, with Miami being hurt, and the Patriots rebuilding, you have a 6-2 and two lead over everyone else who has two wins in this division. It is absolutely yours the rest of the way through. It is yours to lose. It is firmly yours. I was way too premature on the Buffalo Bills downfall. There are a couple other downfalls that I feel I may have predicted correctly with the Cleveland Browns and the Dallas Cowboys being a couple of those teams. But the Bills, boy was I wrong. And yeah, I will take it on the chin and accept that fact. The Bills, this is still your division as far as anyone else is concerned. Yeah. Uh, well played. And for the Seahawks, it's it's all about the run game. Both defending the run and establishing the run. The rushing game, they allowed 164 yards. They themselves ran for 32 yards. Neither of those is acceptable. You have to play better defense against opposing running backs. The time of possession in favor of the Bills was insane. The Bills held the ball for 38 minutes in this game, nearly double what the Seahawks had. The Seahawks had almost 22 minutes. Uh, yeah, that is not okay. And offensively, you guys picked up, what, 30, 32 yards on the ground. You have Kenneth Walker, you have Zach Charbonnet, and Gino can run a little bit. The Bills are not that good of a rush defense. Like, you could have run for way more than this. How many rushing attempts? 17 rushing attempts with 1.9 yards per carry. Yes, shout out the Bills for being able to do that, but also the Seahawks can't do way better than that. So, uh, do better. After that, we have a matchup between the Carolina Panthers and the Denver Broncos. This was a, you know, fairly easy victory for the Broncos. They went out 28 to 14 over the Panthers. The Broncos climbed to a record of 5 and 3 on the year, while the Panthers fall to 1 and 7. In this game, Bryce Young gets the start for an injured Andy Dalton, and he goes 24 of 37 for 224 yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions. Chubb Hubbard with 15 carries for 56 yards, and Jalen Coker with four catches for 78 yards and a touchdown. Uh, and then as for the Broncos, <coughs> as for the Broncos, we've got Bo Nix going 28 of 37 for 284 and three touchdowns. Jaleel McLaughlin has eight carries for 47 yards, and Cortland Sutton with eight catches for 100 yards. My key takeaways from this game, 
for the Panthers. It is the running game. The running game, it was kind of strong earlier in the season. Obviously, you weren't going to get done in the passing game, but Joe Hubbard stood tall. Now, that is kind of falling apart. So, you got to look at two Jonathan Brooks. There's only seven days left to activate him. I don't know what the status is really on his availability this year. Dave Canales has been non-committal. Maybe he'll get activated, maybe he won't. If he's not activated by next Tuesday, he will not play the season. So, the run game, it needs some sort of spark. If Jonathan Brooks is ready to go, plug him in there and see if that can help with at least your running game, getting him back on track. As for the Broncos, just gotta say, take care of the football. The Panthers turned the ball over twice in this game. The Broncos turned the ball over twice in this game. Ideally, you want to be winning that turnover differential. The Broncos' tough defense has been A1 exceptional this year. Make their lives as easy as possible. Keep track of the ball. The fumbles are not, you know, bonix. He did not throw an interception in this game, and I think that is very impressive. As a rookie guy, he has played relatively mistake-free, so these vets that are fumbling, you can't have that. Uh, so just do a better job of securing the football and make life as easy as possible on your defense to help you win these games. After that, we have a matchup between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Las Vegas Raiders. The Chiefs would go on to win this game 27-20 moving to a record of 7-0, while the Raiders fall to a record of 2-6. In this game, we've got Patrick Mahomes going 27 of 38 for 262 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. We also have Kareem Hunt with 21 carries for 59 yards and a touchdown. And then Travis Kelsey on dash to a tight end today with 10 catches for 90 yards and a score. Gardner Minshew for this Las Vegas Raiders team goes 24 of 30 for 209 yards and two touchdowns. We've got Alexander Madison with one of the worst stat lines you'll ever see. 14 carries for 15 yards and Brock Bowers on a national tight end day leading the Raiders with five catches for 58 yards. As far as takeaways go from this game, we have uh, my notes on the Chiefs. I think that you guys need to switch it up in the running back game. I know you are at 7-0, you are undefeated, but this game had a lot of predictability. Kareem Hunt gets 21 carries, Patrick Mahomes gets 6 carries, Carson Stale gets 2 carries. In the receiving game, Samoa J.P. around with 2 targets for 2 catches. Carson Steele with one target for one catch, and Kareem Hunt with one target for one catch. You have three running backs. You can utilize them in a, in a more, like, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but mix it up. Kareem Hunt getting 21 carries, and him getting a 2.8 average. They know what you're doing. They know absolutely what you're doing. There's no reason to be doing that. Get Kareem Hunt more involved in the passing game. Get Carson Steele a few more carries. Give Samoa J.P. Ryan a couple carries. And, yeah, just give them different looks so that they can't stop you every single time. 21 carries for 59 yards is not good. Kareem Hunt, like, the last three weeks, obviously, he's been getting, like, over 20-plus carries. But they're not going for that much. Maybe incorporate the other guys a little more. You don't have to just depend on Kareem Hunt because it's not that effective, obviously. Well, I mean, it, it gets you to where you need to be here at 7 and 0, but I think that this offense could be improved with a little bit more versatility and flexibility in your running back usage. And then for the Raiders, I, I feel bad because Gardner Minshew, for once, I don't think he was the reason that they lost the football game, it was not the passing game. The passing game actually kept them pretty securely in it. I guess Gardner Minshew did fumble the ball, but it was mostly the O-line and the running game that lost them this. Uh, they had five sacks allowed in this game, and the 
Raiders offense was only able to muster up 33 rush yards in total. Alexander Madison, absolute bump. We also had Samir White adding one, two carries for like negative one yard. Um, this, this is not good. So, all those games where I was blaming Gardner Minshew and Andrew O'Connell, it's not even that. It, in this game, you totally could have had it, but what was it like? Third and two, and you guys couldn't score a touchdown. And I look back at it. Yeah, it is first and goal at the Kansas City three. Alexander Madison <coughs> <coughs> runs it up the middle for two yards. Then Alexander Madison runs it up the middle for no gain. Then Alexander Madison gets tackled for two yards for negative two yards, and then Gardner Minshew sacked for minus five yards. You had the ball at the three yard line row. At the Two 
Ezekiel Elliott with 10 carries for 34 yards and a touchdown, and C.D. Lamb with a magnificent performance, 13 catches for 146 yards and two touchdowns. Brock Purdy for the 49ers goes 18 of 26 for 260 and a score. Isaac Guarendo, Billigan for the injured Jordan Mason, has 14 carries for 85 yards and a score. And George Kittle on National Tight Ends Day with 6 catches for 128 yards and a touchdown. My key takeaways here uh, for the Dallas Cowboys. <coughs> for the Cowboys, Dalvin Cook is not your answer. Uh, you guys activate Dalvin Cook. Rico Dowdle is out. This guy is no good at all. Uh, Dak is throwing the ball entirely too much. He throws the ball 38 times in this game, but his passing attempts, they're just too high. You need a real running game. When you had a running game, this this offense was better. Uh, even though Tony Pollard wasn't going to get last year, he was less efficient than a couple years ago. It was still better than what you have now. So you guys have screwed the pooch on this one. You need a real running back. And honestly, it's going to be very hard. For, you're, just, you're just the Bengals at this point. Uh, and for the 49ers, everything looks pretty good. I, I don't really have any complaints about this game. Just be careful about the penalties. Penalties, you go 9 penalties for 73 yards. Almost got a pass interference call towards the end of the game there. Honestly, don't think the Cowboys would have done all that much. You go, it was like, yes, maybe it was pass interference. It could go either way, but on the third, first three plays, you played good defense, so don't ruin good defense with bad penalties. Be a little more disciplined. Other than that, great performance. And finally, Monday Night Football, we've got a matchup between the New York Giants and the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Steelers would win this game with a final score of 26-18 to 18 over the Giants. Daniel Jones goes 24-38 of 38 for 264 and an interception. Tyrone Gracie Jr. has 20 carries for 145 yards and a touchdown. And Darius Slayton has 4 catches for 108 yards. For the Steelers, Russell Wilson with 20 of 28 passing, 278 yards and a score. Najee Harris with 19 carries for 114 yards. And finally, George Pickens with 4 catches for 74 yards. Key takeaways for this game for the Giants. What was that two-point conversion attempt, man? First of all, there's really no reason to go for a two-point conversion there. Like, what was the situation? You were down. You were down. Nine to twenty-three. You score the touchdown. It is now fifteen to twenty-three. If you get the extra point here. It is 16 to 23. It is a seven point game. That is what you want. You are, yes, you, you could go for the two, but is it really benefiting you? Like, I just don't understand the decision. If this was the touchdown that had either tied the game or given you the lead, if it was a, if you scored 21 points, or 22 points, and now you're choosing between, uh, do I go for 24, or do I go for the tie with 23, that is different. You're not even there yet. Why are you digging yourself a deeper hole? And why are you running that play? Like, what is that four guys to the, to the numbers, and then, <coughs> like, neighbors with a, a screen and they're not even covered like my brain hurts trying to understand it is one of the worst drawn up plays I've seen not as bad as the Colts versus the Patriots on fourth down but almost as bad and then for the Steelers I don't even remember what I said what was it uh that was the red zone have to be better in the red zone. You made the red zone four times in this game, but you walk away with zero touchdowns on those four red zone trips. That is not good. I uh, got it. Got to be better in that department. And yeah, that that's all. So with that, we are done with our week eight recap. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, 
so now you can buckle in for the weak died waiver weak died waiver wire pickups segment of this video hello to all my fellow fantasy footballers out there we finally made it to the week nine waiver wire pickup segment of this video so if you're unfamiliar i'm going to go through each of the major skill positions giving you my top three additions from the upcoming pool of free agents in order to qualify for a waiver wire pickup these players have to be available in at least 50 percent of leagues and i use primarily espn fantasy so that is the metric i'm going off of so first up when it comes to quarterbacks i have three quarterbacks for you this week and the number one would be bonix bonix is owned in 36.7 percent of leagues after last week he finishes as the quarterback too i recommended him last week because of his matchup against the panthers and he did go off he finishes as a quarterback too on the entire week uh and this week he gets to play against the ravens who if you are aware have a pass funnel defense meaning they limit the run and they try and get you to beat them through the pass something we have seen week in and week out they have allowed a lot of fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks this year uh, guys like baker mayfield like Jameis winston have absolutely popped off against the ravens when they play against them i don't think that it will be any different with bonix this week so that is number one number two in the quarterback department is matthew stafford currently owned in 18.5 percent of leagues we have seen what he can do when cooper cup and puka Nakua are healthy last year he went on a little bit of a run towards the end of the year pretty viable fantasy option i think he is returning to that status cup and puka out for all these weeks he was kind of a bum but with them back he touches four touchdown passes he, he completes four touchdown passes in this game <coughs> and finishes as the overall quarterback five uh, very easy to pick him up obviously no rushing upside for him but if you need just a plug and play guy he can do it and then finally we've got Derek Carr currently on in 11.5 percent of games as I mentioned earlier he is scheduled to return week nine from his oblique injury and he will be playing a Carolina Panthers defense who just allowed the quarterback to finish to Bo Nix and yeah, opposing quarterbacks have been vulturing on this defense. So, Derek Carr, uh, with a healthy Chris Olave and a, yeah, Juwan Johnson, who has cleared concussion protocol, Alvin Kamara, obviously a little bit banged up, but this offense should see a bump with him back in, and I think that he will be able to feast on this defense. After that, let us move into running backs. Three running backs on the week for you. Number one, this is a, a re-up, Tyrone, Tyrone Tracy Jr., owned in 46% of leagues. Uh, anytime this year that he has gone more than 10 touches, he has been a running back to a fantasy football running back to option. Now, Devin Singletary being limited, not getting that many touches in this game, I think bodes well for Tyrone Tracy Jr. Speculated a couple weeks back that he might be taking the draw from Singletary, and it seems like we're at that stage. Just had his best game of the season, and he is questionable. He might have a concussion. If he misses week nine, then all the more reason to pick him up for week ten when he is going to play against the Panthers. So either way, I would consider rostering Tyrone Tracy Jr. if you have not already, or if he is available in your league. After that, we've got Isaac Correndo, owned in 3.6% of leagues. This is the San Francisco 49ers' fourth string running back with Christian McCaffrey and Elijah Mitchell on IR and Jordan Mason in exiting the game with a shoulder injury. Uh, there is a slight chance, you know, Christian McCaffrey, he has been reported to be available to come back uh, in week 10 after the San Francisco 49ers' bye week, so he would suit up against the Buccaneers. Jordan Mason out with shoulder injury they have a bye week maybe he comes back and is ready to play but i think there is a reality where neither of those guys are actually ready to go christian mccaffrey was supposed to be ready to go week one we saw how that happened how that turned out and jordan mason 
this injury. Obviously, he's been he's been dealing with some injuries in the last couple games. Isaac Corindo filling in for him pretty nicely in this game. At 17 touches in the win over the Cowboys, I will <coughs> get him now when his value is still low with the bye week. If next week all these news things come out that McCaffrey is not ready and Jordan Mason is still out, it'll be a little bit harder. If you have the space, maybe get Corindo now, even though he is heading into his bye. And then finally, a little bit of a stretch, but we've got Miles Sanders, owned in 8.1% of leagues. He saw seven targets in this past week, which was tied for third amongst running backs. He also plays the Saints this upcoming week, who are currently allowing the fifth most fantasy points to opposing running backs this season. And this is the caveat. Only pick him up if Jonathan Brooks does not get activated. Because as of right now, Sanders is the RB2 behind Chubb Hubbard, but Chubb Hubbard has been on the decline. Sanders getting seven targets. Bryce Young probably is getting the start once again. It bodes well for Sanders, only if Brooks is not activated. So keep track of that. If Brooks is activated, then Sanders is done. I, I would not trust him. If Brooks is not activated, he's not ready to go in week nine, then maybe Miles Sanders. After that, let us move into wide receivers. First up, we've got Josh Downs. Josh Downs currently owned in 48.7% of leagues, just under our threshold. And the reason I have been avoiding him for all this time is because of the quarterback controversy in Indianapolis. Anthony Richardson finally being benched for Joe Flacco <coughs> means we can look at Josh Downs for what he is worth with Flacco. And that is a guy who can average 19.2 points per game in with the right quarterback. Anthony Richardson has been holding this team back. Obviously, you want to prioritize his development. I think they have called it quits. He is not good. He gave a bad media response. They are going with Joe Flacco because they're at a, they're at a decent record. And Joe Flacco can absolutely feed this man. So, Josh Downs, 19.2 points per game with Flacco at quarterback. He is tied for fourth in targets since week four uh, with 42. And he is going to play the Vikings this upcoming week. And they have been allowing the most fantasy points to opposing wide receivers this year. So, Josh Downs is a priority ad if you can get him. Obviously, most leagues he has gone, but if you can't get him, do so. After that, we've got two Browns wide receivers for you. Number one is Cedric Doman, owned in 16.2% of leagues. Recommended him last week, and if you didn't get him, well, you can. This is probably your last chance to get him now. Went off uh, against the Ravens. Finished as the wide receiver three on the week. He's had 21 targets over the last two weeks. Not a great matchup against the Chargers this week, but with Jameis Winston in, this is this is a guy that you want. We've seen him in back to back back to back weeks put up solid, solid numbers. And if he is a wide receiver on one on this team with Jameis throwing the ball, I think it's time to buy. And then the other Browns wide receiver has to be Elijah Moore, currently owned in 1.3% of leagues. He is also viable with Winston in at quarterback. His best two games of the season have been after the Amari Cooper trade, same with Cedric Doman, and his 12 targets this week was tied for fifth amongst all wide receivers. So, James Winston's a guy who likes to throw the ball. He can chuck the ball anywhere on the field. It's not a very to throw one, two, three, four, five interceptions. And he didn't throw any last week, so I think the Browns are going to give him a big leash. He might go for big chunk plays. We saw him throw some heavy-duty on-run type touchdowns last week. I would r roster both of these guys. Maybe not like both on one team, but go for either one. And then after that, we've got tight ends. First up in the tight end category, going with Noah Fant of the Seattle Seahawks, currently owned in 8.8% of leagues. Uh, he could see more volume if DK happens to miss another week with his knee injury. And he'll be playing the Rams this week, who are currently allowing the second most fantasy points to opposing tight ends. After that, we've got 
will this lead once again? Currently owned in 1.4% of leagues. Uh, and yet again, this is completely dependent on Hayden Hurst. Hayden Hurst has been out with a groin injury, I believe it is. And so, with him out, Will Disley has had 18 targets over the last two weeks, which is tied for fourth amongst all tight ends. If Hurst is sidelined once again, I would go after Disley. And then finally, we've got Mike Gusecki, currently owned in 10.3% of leagues. Not a huge fan of Mike Gusecki. He has fumbled many times this season in critical times, uh, but he saw eight targets last week, and currently T. Higgins is being ruled as day-to-day -day with a quad injury, so if T. Higgins happens to not play this week, then that, T that opens up a <coughs> opens up a larger role for Mike Gusecki on this offense once again. Wow, they are they're doing a lot out there. Uh, finally, let's go into defenses. Three defenses for you. We've got number one, the Bengals, owned thirty-nine percent of leagues. They play the Raiders, who just allowed five sacks and a fumble recovery. Then you've got the Saints. Saints defense owned in thirty-nine percent of leagues also, but they're going to be playing the Panthers with Bryce Young at quarterback and no more Deontay Johnson. So that's pretty easy. And finally, the most stretch reach start in the defense category has to be the Patriots defense, who have a great matchup against the Titans, who are currently allowing the second most points to opposing defenses. And yeah, with that, we are done with our week eight recap, our week nine waiver wire. Uh, I, I'm feeling the brain fog, I can't lie. Uh, I don't know if I have COVID. I think it'd be pretty fantastic if everyone I spent the weekend with some of them got COVID and I somehow didn't die and I'm continuing to live with them. I have called out from my classes for the next couple of days just because I have a feeling even though I tested negative today and I am going to test positive in the next couple of days, it is somewhat inevitable. Like, we were sharing water cups, we were in the same car, we have been in constant contact for like the last four days straight. I'm bound to have it at some point. But I've never had it before, so I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how it goes. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for watching. If you enjoy content like this, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be putting out more videos as the weeks progress. Unless I have COVID and I get really flabby. Uh, but yeah, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.